I'm Neil Farrow. I've been a controls engineer for a couple decades. And like most controls engineers, I started off in Vision um, when there was a problem with an existing camera system. And then I like tweaked the exposure and uh, the machine was running and I thought I was a hero and thought I understood Vision. And as I used Vision more and more, I realized how little I knew. And this is a presentation I wished I had seen at the beginning. So I hope you get some good things out of it too. This talk's entitled Vision System Success for Controls Engineers, but it's really just about the fundamentals. So to succeed your vision system, you just have to create a high contrast stable image. That's all. But you do it by nailing these fundamentals. Lighting, lensing, material handling, and then maintenance and sustainability. And that's what we're going to cover. A little background. In 2009, this was the situation for the vision system market. On the low end, the low cost, low performance, you had a vision sensor. And that's a, an easily configurable camera. Then in the middle of the cost and performance, you had a programmable smart camera. And that's the distinction between the two. The vision sensors configurable and the smart cameras programmable. At the high end, the high cost and the high performance, you've got the PC-based vision. In 2017, this is what we have. The vision sensor cost remained about the same and uh, its performance improved greatly. The smart camera performance improved also, but uh, the gap between vision sensor and smart camera is closing. And the PC-based is still out front in terms of performance and cost. This is a pie chart that shows the yellow uh, back in 2009. Our um, training classes for vision covered mostly how to con program a particular smart camera. And just the red wedge is uh, what was left over for the fundamentals of creating a stable image, what this talk is about. So, uh, with the easily configurable smart cameras, we can flip that around and spend more time on the fundamentals and less time on how do you program a camera. So, th this is the problem with the way we used to do it. Comments like this from your customer. Your camera sucks. I can tell it's a bad part from here. Why can't your camera? Well, uh, truth be told, when I was a controls engineer, I actually said this to my <laughs> vision system consultant. And, um, you know, I would never have said it had I known the contents of this talk. But it does bring up a point. Um, you know, our brain has had thousands or year of years of evolution, and it's really, really great at pattern recognition. Um, the cameras need contrast. You need to see a black image on a white background or a white on a black background. Um, people, though, uh, people need context to help them out. So cameras need the contrast, and people need context, as we see here. Uh, every other image here is a dog, and every other one is a marshmallow. Can you spot which is which? Hence the context. context. There's not really context because we're zoomed in so closely. Can you spot the owl or the apple? Which one of these is a muffin and which is a chihuahua? Cat or ice cream? Parrot or guacamole? And finally, which is the purebred dog and which is the inbred dog? So the point of that, you know, people need context. Cameras need contrast. We'll talk about imagers here. Uh, this is probably a review for a lot of people. Each individual pixel uh, has a value of 0 to 255. So the lens focuses on the imager chip broken up into these individual cells, pixels. And 0 is black. It means there's no light. And 255 means maximum light. And if you have more than maximum light, the value is still 255. For color, this is the most common way to get color. In front of each pixel, you put a color filter so it only sees a particular color. 
red, green, or blue. And there are more green. Uh, this is called the Bayer pattern. Um, color does require right, white light because if you had, say, red light, uh, only the red pixels would light up, uh, but white light has all the colors. There's at least three popular color models. Um, not all cameras and vision sensors have all three. Um, red, green, blue, we're probably familiar with from computer monitors. The HSV stands for hue, saturation, and value. This is basically the color wheel like we learned in kindergarten art class. And um, LAB was made to uh, codify color the way we see it. Um, and the great thing about LAB is there's this concept of color distance. If you have a known color and you plot it in three-dimensional space in the LAB space, and then you measure a test object in three-dimensional space, if you measure the linear distance between those two, in LAB space, if it's one or less, it's imperceivable. It's the same color to humans. And if it's two, it's the same to most humans. So in vision systems, as in life, uh, everything is a trade-off. So here we see the red, green, blue is the native format. And if we use the other two color models, we do have to uh, take a little bit more execution time which may or may not be a problem. Uh, to illustrate the three different color models, this is the, the same target we're going to show you with each color model. You can see this histogram, the red, the green, the blue. We've got peaks in a particular uh, location. This is the same object under hue, saturation, and value, HSV, and the same object under LAB. And the point of these is they're vastly different. And what that means is in real life, often for an application, one of these models will give greater differentiation between good and bad parts. Numerically, on these three axes, you'll, you'll find a, a greater difference between the good and bad parts. So to create a high contrast stable image, here are some uh, variables and parameters that uh, you can tweak. Uh, we're not going to, you don't have to read each one, we're going to get through it, but just to categorize them, some are easily adjustable. That's what we'll focus on. You have to be aware some are interdependent, meaning when you change one, you change some of the others. Uh, some are time consuming. For example, if you are in a startup and you realize you need a, a lens with a different field of view or a different focal length, um, you, you need to go buy a new lens. <laughs> so um, finally, there are some parameters that are not possible to adjust. So you have to just be aware of that up front and account for it using the things that you can change. So these will include like the customer's part, obviously. Maybe it's an existing machine um, that has a, a conveyor or an indexing mechanism. Um, you can't change those. You can't change the light in the factory. I mean, this is why vision systems are so confusing, but uh, we're going to try to break it down for you. Um, with lighting, lensing, and material handling again. And yeah, as in real life, we're probably not going to get to the fourth item maintenance. And the other thing that's not on this list is camera programming didn't make the list. So let's cover lighting. For lighting, we're going to cover a review of visible light properties and uh, then a bunch of lighting techniques, including strobing light, with some examples. And we'll go over how to select a light and using different colors in your lighting to help your application. This <clears throat> is the visible spectrum. We've got blue on the left over to red on the right. And uh, beyond our vision, on the left, we've got ultraviolet. And that comes into play because some materials, when you shine UV light on them, they'll fluoresce as blue. So objects, some objects look blue under UV light. And off to the right, we can't see infrared, but cameras can. 
So when light hits an object, sometimes uh, it could uh, absorb, the light could be absorbed in the material. If it's transparent, it could transmit through. Uh, it could also fluoresce, like we talked about under UV. But most often, light hits an object and it reflects. And from high school physics, you may remember the angle at which it hits an object is the same as the angle it bounces off. And uh, keep that in mind in the next few slides. This spider diagram shows uh, features of the different technologies of lighting you can use for machine vision. And to summarize, just use LEDs. You can pause and look at this more. Also, I'll mention now, um, if you look in the comments below, there's links to jump just to the right, of, just to the part of the presentation you want uh, for review later on. So once you've settled on LED, this is a partial selection of different LED lights from just one manufacturer. So how do you select a light? Well, we're going to talk about lighting techniques, and then it'll... Uh, help narrow down the choices. Some basic lighting techniques. We'll start off with a uh, bright field. You can see the camera at the top when the light's uh, shining from about up near, above near the camera. That's bright field as opposed to if you take the same light and you tilt it at an angle 45 or less to the horizontal that's called dark field. And when we cover examples, these names will make more sense. It's not rocket science. Um, backlighting's a third popular kind of self-explanatory. Other techniques, you can get this coaxial diffuse light. Some companies call it a dual on axis light. I don't know why a dual light, but you can see the light source on the left hits a two-way mirror and uh, bounces down on the target, and the camera looks through the two-way mirror onto the lighted target. And this is great for very shiny, flat objects. If you have a shiny object that's not flat, then you could use this diffuse dome. It's like a salad bowl. It has light shooting up. It's scattered, scatters the light. And you can see the camera shoots through a hole in the bottom of the salad bowl. Next, flat Diffuse lights, um, collimated light. That basically means the, the, the light rays are all going straight into the camera. You could use a combination of these, and you could use a structured light, which is a laser line or a, a light pattern you could lay over um, the target to show its texture. Here's an example bright field on the left, dark field on the right. If you look at this bright field image on the left, at first glance it looks pretty good. It's black and white. But really it's black and white and gray. And the image on the right is really black and white. If you're looking for those little supports under the shelves, the image on the right um, is better for a camera because the numbers are different. No grays in the middle, just low numbered black, high number white. So here's a typical bright field ring of light. It shows the cross section. And here's a ring light for dark field. You could take the bright field ring light and lower it closer to the part and get a dark field effect. But if you notice, the LEDs of the dark field are actually pointing in. So you're, it's best to get a ring light made for dark field. And this is what's going on. If you look at the leftmost arrow, it hits the flat surface and it bounces away. It does not go up into the camera, so everything flat appears dark. If you have uh, a dent, like the middle arrow, some of the light will hit it and bounce directly into the camera, so the dent will look bright. Similarly, on the right, if you've got a bump, some of the light will hit the bump and make it look light against the dark background. Uh, in this example, it's against a mirrored surface. Again, we're looking at uh, first the bright field ring light. And this is what it looks like to the camera. You can see in the upper right. It, um, 
uh, you can see the individual LEDs of the light and the black circle in the middle is the hole the camera's looking through. If we look at dark field 45 or lower to horizontal on a mirrored surface, we can see scratches on the surface. A more common use might be this, um, like on a metal part with a dot peen printed code, uh, dark field light works great because the background will be black, it'll be zero, and the dots will be very bright. Uh, for bright field light, it looks good to us. It looks like, you know, uh, black and white, but really it, the dots are dark, dark gray and the background is a lighter gray. So you could have, uh, you know, your bright field could be a range of something like 40 to 100 and your dark field could be 0 to 200. So for a camera, the dark field really makes a difference. And here again is a review in the top. We've got bright field lights. Uh, on the left, a spotlight. On the right, a ring light. And on the bottom, dark field lights. Uh, on the left, the spotlight, you just change the angle and make it dark field. But uh, on the lower right, you need really need to buy a ring light made for dark field lights. It doesn't cost any more. It's just the appropriate light if you need dark field. Here's an example, uh, a part under bright field and dark field. Next, this is my favorite. We've got this barcode under cellophane. And this is with a coaxial diffuse, a dull light, and it doesn't look that great because the cellophane's not perfectly flat. Here's a bright field. Not good either. Hard to read the code. This is better. A dark field ring light. This is the best. Um, if you look at this light on the left, it's actually two inches high and goes away from us about eight inches. And it could even be uh, closer to the horizontal. And that's the best for this application. Backlighting is great for edge or hole detection or translucent materials with liquid level, part presence, absence, uh, vision-guided robots, VGR, and gauging, actually measuring distances or hole diameter on machined parts. Um, some things to think about. You want to use monochrome light. You don't want to use white light. You can see at the top here the red light going through a hole scatters more. It's a longer wavelength compared to blue. Uh, blue might be better. Blue is better and um, because it's a shorter wavelength. The edges are a little bit crisper with blue. If you're using backlight to penetrate an object, then in general you want longer wavelengths to penetrate objects as shown on the circuit board. The red light penetrates a little bit, but the infrared penetrates even more. And what we're trying to do here is verify ICs are all placed on the circuit board, like before soldering. Another example, liquid level in a bottle. Red light, uh, hmm, it looks like a solid bottle. Same with infrared. Uh, in this case, uh, despite what we just said, usually the longer wavelength penetrates better, but here, it so happens blue light penetrates the clear bottle so we can see the liquid level. We talked about collimated lighting. Here this shows the left edge. You can see the left edge is kind of fuzzy. It's not exactly crisp uh, black to white. If you add some collimation film to the lens, it could make the edge a little crisper. This example, well, we're trying to measure accurately the uh, distance, the dimensions of this sensor. So the yellow is the search area and the green is the measured distance. But how accurate is it? Well, the software from the vendor, camera vendor, can tell you or you could calculate how big is a pixel. Uh, if it's 1.07 millimeters, as shown here, and the customer needed a 0.1 millimeter, you'd think you're golden. But uh, skipping to the end, it, you, all you can really tell your customer is 1.07. You got to move the decimal point, multiply by 10. And here's why. If we zoom in on that left edge, you can see that in the 
upper diagram, and the lower shows the edge strength. It shows a narrow uh, peak, mountain peak, uh, at the green edge, and that's pretty good. If we zoom in even more, you can start to see that, uh, hey, this edge isn't maybe so crisp after all, not as crisp as we thought. As shown here, this is starting on the left. It's not even black. It's a dark gray, goes to a lighter gray, to an even lighter gray, finally to white. And it turns out the best we can theoretically ever do is three pixels. You can't go one pixel black to white. There's got to be a gray in between because of physics. And um, so if each edge is four times two is eight, you know, you might as well round up to 10 to keep the math simple and give you some wiggle room. So really the best we can do is 1.07. So tell the customer plus or minus half that. People always ask, is that really the best? Is there anything we can do to make it better? And you can, you could add a special lens, a telecentric lens. In this example on the top, these uh, cylinders look squared off. And on the bottom, you can see a standard lens that shows the tops a little bit curved. Um, this shows telecentric better. If you look in the bottom right, we're looking through a tube. But in the top, through a telecentric lens, it looks like a ring because the telecentric lens only lets in parallel light rays. So the question is, well, why not use a telecentric for everything? Well, this is what they look like, and they have to be bigger than your ob object. So uh, if this blue trapezoid is our object, you can see how if the light has to go above and below it to see the edges, uh, how the telecentric lens needs to be bigger than your object. And here we talked about collimated light, as in the one we have here on the left. It shoots out, the light only shoots out parallel through the object in the middle to the telecentric lens that only accepts parallel light. If you make it blue light, you know, that's the best we could ever do. Um, but then your lighting, your lensing costs more than your camera. Here's an example of what a... Uh, a dull light looks like. And this kind of explains what's going on. The light shoots down, you can see here on the left arrow, hits the flat surface and bounces back so it looks bright. The next arrow to the right hits a divot and the light scatters away. It doesn't go back into the camera. So that's how uh, divots look dark and the surface looks bright. Um, in this example on a bearing chase, if we zoom in and focus, even on a shiny machine surface, you can read the serial number or model number off of the bearing chase. Um, next up, this is what the diffuse dome, an actual diffuse dome looks like. And you can see around the bottom edge there, the individual LEDs uh, that shoot up into the dome to scatter the light on the target below. And again, the camera shoots through a hole in the salad bowl. Um, and similarly, it shows, uh, uh, be because the light is so scattered, uh, it can uh, light up even curved, shiny objects. And we looked at the dull light. The dull light's great for only flat, shiny objects. So, this dome light creates minimal glare, and here's an example of a shiny object, and this is my favorite in the bottom here. You've got the bottom of a spray can of spray paint. So if you shined a spotlight on it, or, or a ring light, you'd end up with some hot spots. But the dome light, uh, you can actually read this uh, text printed on the bottom of the curved can. Next, we have a flat dome, which is really a misnomer. There's a whole array of LEDs behind this red with a plastic, looks like UHMW, some kind of diffusing material to scatter the light. And what's great about this kind compared to the flat dome, it, well, it doesn't take up as much room, but it also has a longer working distance, meaning your camera can be further away from your target. And here's an example. If we have these metal pucks on a tray with a 2D code printed on them. 
if we use bright field lighting, we can barely see the code. But the machining marks look good. Uh, dark field looks better. Uh, diffuse coaxial, hmm, not so good. The dome light, it looks quite bad. It will have no chance of reading those codes. But here's a flat diffuse light that actually is the best in this example. Structured light is up next. You can see this laser, it's tilted off to the left. It's also tilted away from us. And the camera's shooting straight down from above and it looking at this zigzag uh, laser line. And here in the lower left, this is what it looks like to the camera. Uh, you've got a line on the um, background and uh, some distance away is the line on top of the target. And if the target were taller, the distance of these two lights segment line segments would be further apart. And if there's no part, it looks like a straight line. So this is great for like if you've got sheet metal overlap. Here on the left, we have two Allen wrenches zoomed in on the structured light. So you could see for presence or absence it, this would be pretty straightforward. If they weren't there, this would just be a straight line. Now, when selecting a light, it's, it's great to have graphs like this, and the yellow shows 60 to 80% with the brighter red spot in the middle. So that's really what you want to look at. You want your target to certainly be within there, usually. And on this ring light uh, this is shown uh, this graph is shown at at 300 millimeters away so if your target was 900 millimeters away th this might not be the light for you and on the right uh, if we happen to have a long narrow object uh, let's say we had a long narrow eight inch object you know out of the box you'd think no problem the catalog has an eight inch light but if you look at this intensity distribution uh, you'll find that uh, to be within that yellow circle, you actually need a 10 or 12 inch light. So just keep that in mind. Just look at these real quick. It doesn't take long. Make sure uh, out of the gate, it, it looks like uh, it's gonna work for you. And of course you have to try it in real life to be sure. Now this graph shows a summary of the various lighting technologies. And on the horizontal axis, we've got starting at zero, a flat matte finish. And going to the right, it gets more and more shiny, more specular. And the horizontal axis, it starts off with curved objects. And um, as you go up, it goes through uneven uh, topography onto flatter and flatter. So you might want to pause and take a look at this. And note the difference between the flat diffuse and the dome light. A lot of smart cameras and vision sensors have built-in light, uh, but a good rule of thumb though is beyond a foot and a half, you're going to need external light. This picture just shows uh, how great strobing can be. It can stop a bullet. This was taken by Harold Edgerton, and you can see the bullets shooting out of the apple is in crisp focus. These fans are all running at the same speed, and as you decrease the shutter speed, it stops the motion. So when we first go to uh, add strobing to an application, uh, this is where we often end up. Uh, the amount of light we're adding is about the same as the ambient light, and our image may be a little dark, so we increase the... Uh, exposure time or the shutter speed and um, that helps you get a, a brighter image but uh, you're still leaving half of your lighting to chance to the ambient conditions and when strobing this is what you really want you want eight or ten times brighter light to flash on to wash out the ambient light conditions and you can look at the area under this curve it's just as much light as the middle example. So when strobing, 
you want to use a photo eye. A through beam is the best because it's a like a focus laser. It's a focus beam that when it's broken, it uh, it'll be broken at the same part position every time. And people sometimes don't want to wire up the second sensor, the receiver, and they don't want to put it on the drawing. So you, know, you can use a retroreflective. That's also a beam break. Um, and you know, the least desirable it does work is the background suppression sensor. But um, if uh, the part is further away, it won't pick up the part. Or in this example, if the IC pin is bent, it won't pick up the part. So there's some photo eye options for triggering, but also consider the specifications. Look at the specs on your photo eye to make sure it's fast enough. Just run the numbers on your conveyor speed and make sure your photo eye is fast enough that it's not the limiting factor. So we live in a PLC centric world and everybody wants to run everything through the PLC and we spend hours developing PLC signal lists, but for machine vision, you've got to wire the photo eye to the camera. And also, your light has to be controlled by the camera so that when we change the shutter speed or the exposure time in the camera, uh, the cameras actually uh, can change that along with the, the job that it's running from part to part. And... Um, the camera will actually control the amount of time that the light is on. So um, some people really insist they want to wire the light through the PLC, and you can do that. But after you turn on the light, you need to delay for 50 milliseconds before you trigger the camera. And yes, that's a very long time, but it really is a good starting point. And here's why. This is a logarithmic scale, but when you turn on the light, you get... Uh, peak brightness and after 0.1 seconds or so it plateaus so if you're in the steep part of this curve uh, when you your, your PLC cycle time can really matter as far as are you way down on the bottom of intensity or way on the top in intensity which will make your images be inconsistent not stable so therefore if you're controlling it with a PLC, you just have to wait until the light is in that stable plateau or strobe it through the camera. Your choice. Next up, lighting colors. We talked about white light has all the colors, and so you got to use that for color cameras. It is more ambient light susceptible. Red is another popular color. Um, because red LEDs were the first bright, cheapest ones. Um, but with a red filter, it can be more ambient light resistant than white. And you just got to be aware, like if you have packaging applications, it can make parts look different. Same with infrared. Parts can look really weird under infrared light. So you just have to try it. But a good thing about infrared is operators can't see it, so it won't annoy them. We talked a little bit about blue light for metal and a little bit about UV. We'll get into that more. Uh, but whatever color you want, there's probably a machine vision light for it. Next, we'll cover lensing. We'll go over focal length versus field of view, color filters, more in depth on UV and IR lighting how to avoid glare, including polarizing filters, and then we'll talk about some trade-offs. So this graph shows different focal lengths. So if you have a given working distance, a given distance from your camera to target, uh, if you look at the red 75 millimeter focal length, that's zoomed in on like a really small portion. Um, and if you look at the opposite end, the green six millimeter, that's a wide angle lens. So um, there's, again, software you can use to figure out based on your part size, just which lens you should use. So uh, one thing to keep in mind though, with the six millimeter, with the wide angle lens, especially you do get a little bit of distortion at the edges. This shows the same graph paper at the same distance 
with lenses of different focal lengths, the 6, the 25, and the 50 you're zooming in. And this is our software uh, that we give away for free. Some people have an Excel spreadsheet. Just ask whatever camera manufacturer you're working with. Uh, another thing to keep in mind, we have higher and higher resolutions of cameras. If you have a megapixel camera, you need a megapixel rated lens. If you save money on a lens, you're sacrificing the success of your vision system. Next up, color filters. Uh, here's an example with red and green capsules uh, that all look about the same. But if we apply a green filter in front of the lens, you can see uh, it differentiates them. Or a red filter also differentiates the red from the green. And this is a summary of no filter with red filters and green filters. Here's a different kind of summary. You can see at the top with no filter, in the middle, with the red filter, it lets red light in, so the reds are brighter. On the bottom, with the green filter, it lets green light in, so green capsules are brighter. And this is assuming white light with various colored filters. Um, the most common use of filters is when you have right light, white light to use, or excuse me, when you have red light to use a red filter. And if you have infrared light, you know, use an infrared filter. Obviously, as shown here, you can see in the lower right, you've got a red bandpass filter or infrared or blue, any color you want. Most colors are available. Next, we'll talk about UV and near-infrared light. Again, the visible spectrum, UV is off to the left. We can't see it, nor can the cameras. Over on the right, uh, cameras can see it. Here's the human visual spectrum, and here's a typical uh, camera sensor. It can see a little bit into the infrared. Uh, some of the slides showed near infrared, near the visible spectrum. So if you're picking a infrared light, you want one with a lower wavelength. Here's some examples. Fluorescent printing. Um, this is with ultraviolet light, fluoresces blue. Here's another, um, some nylon can fluoresce under UV light. This is a, a nut with a white lock washer under white light. And here it is with a UV and a short pass filter. Um, another common application is Loctite. Industrial Loctite um, has a UV tracer. So you could test the part uh, before applying Loctite to make sure it's not a rework. Apply the Loctite look at it and make sure it's the right amount. That'll be a lot. It'll be pretty bright. After you assemble the part, you push in the uh, bushing or you put on the nut, you may want to look for no Loctite um, leaked out, or you may want to ensure a certain amount of over application after the fact. And this is just to show there are many companies that make fluorescent markers and dyes you could add to your existing products. When using infrared, it can cause some weird color differences. Here we have some crayons with uh, white light, and here they are under infrared. And um, under white light, these all look black, shown with the arrows, but this is the actually the only black crayon. So infrared can help or hurt you. Here's another example with packaging. On the left, we've got white light. You can see the barcode and the packaging. Under red light, you can only see the barcode. And under infrared, you can see nothing. Next, we've got this black part under a multicolored background. On the bottom, the white light is black against a gray background. The red's black against black, and you can see on the top, the infrared has the best contrast. Next topic is uh, avoiding surface glare. Uh, you can change the geometry. You can tilt the light. Or if you're using the built-in light, you can tilt the camera just 10 degrees. You could strobe uh, if the glare is coming from ambient light sources. And the last resort is to use a polarizing filter. And 
This is because the light has a filter and uh, the camera has a filter. So you're filtering out all these this light so you actually end up needing more light. Um, here's an example. We've got a plastic connector with some text. The camera's perpendicular. You can't read the text. If we tilt the camera 10 degrees, you can read the text. Next, this is a styling gel, and this plastic bottle is curved right and left and up and down. So no matter where we put a spotlight or a ring light, we're going to end up with some bright spots. But you can see on the right, uh, with a polarizing filter, uh, you can see the whole entire label. Here's a Welch's juice bottle with no filter and with a polarizing filter. Um, here's another option uh, for a vision sensor. Uh, you can get a polarizing filter only on half of the lights. So you could only turn on half the upper left half of the lights for polarizing light or the lower right uh, for non-polarizing light. So you can do both. Here's an important key concept. We're starting about talking about the trade-offs, aperture versus depth of field. Um, in this top example, you can see on the right, the aperture is wide open, and this stick figure is the target in focus, and you can see the white box. Uh, it's not that thick. So that's the area in which... Um, if, if the man moves forward or back, he'll still be in focus. And that doesn't require much light. But if you close down the aperture, if you restrict the amount of light that can come in, in the middle, you can see the white box gets bigger. When you focus on the man, you can see a little bit closer to the lens and much further away from the lens. And that does require a little bit more light. And if you restrict the uh, amount of light, if you close the aperture as shown in the bottom, you get a much greater depth of field, meaning the guy will be in focus over a much greater distance from the camera, which obviously requires a lot more light. So the classic example is if you have a conveyor with uh, different size boxes, if you're aiming down on the conveyor and you've got tall boxes or short boxes, then you need to be concerned about the depth of field. This slide is from a photography website. It shows the same thing. If you look at the top row in white, you can see the aperture size is small, and both the man in the background and the mountains in the background are in focus. And as you go to the right, we're keeping the man in focus, and the backgrounds become more and more blurry as our aperture opens up. The middle gray is talking about shutter speed. Uh, we've got a running uh, athlete on the left with a fast shutter speed in focus and as we get longer and longer shutter speeds he gets blurrier and more blurry. Finally in the bottom this shows uh, normal gain on the left the image is, looks good and as we go to the right and we add more and more gain on the imager chip to make the image brighter it also makes it more grainy we get more noise. So that's sometimes aperture is called f-stop, sometimes shutter speed is called exposure time. <clears throat> this is the trade-off aperture versus depth of field. As we increase the aperture, our depth of field, the, the distance at which we're in focus changes, reduces. Um, shutter speed um, versus motion is the trade-off and gain versus noise. So here's a summary of those three. And these all, increasing these three things, gain, aperture, and exposure time, all make the image brighter with a trade-off of uh, if it moves, it's blurry, it'll get noisy, or you reduce your depth of field. Finally, we're on to material handling. Under material handling, we'll talk about indexing conveyors, robot-guided vision, um, a conveyor belts with crowder bar, software alignments, and we'll go on to um, maintenance and application examples if we have time. So ideally what will happen is uh, 
you have an indexing conveyor. And here you can see the palette with the part fixtured uh, very well in blue with a mechanical stop that lowers and the part indexes below the camera to another mechanical stop. The part stops, the camera takes a picture, and analyzes it as good or bad, and then releases it. Uh, another ideal situation is to have a robot grip the part and pause in front of the camera so it can take a picture. There are many different kinds of indexing conveyors available out there. Conveyors that move, then stop, move, then stop. Uh, more often, we've got random parts on a conveyor moving at one speed. And you can do that too. Um, it helps though if you could use a crowder bar as shown here. First it moves all the parts over to one side and then back to the middle. And you can see maybe the exit conveyor is running faster to space the parts out. So that lets you move the camera closer to get a better image of the, only the parts because you don't have to look at the whole uh, conveyor width anymore. As shown here, with random parts, you have to be further away. Each part is smaller. Uh, with a crowder bar, you can zoom in and see more part detail, or you can measure the distances more accurately. So sometimes on conveyors, the part's not presented uh, the same. It's random, So, which leads us to this key concept of alignment or software fixturing. Here you can see we're trying to measure the uh, distance of these two holes in the sensor and it works great until the part moves and then we fail a bad part. So what we can do about that with software fixturing, we'll focus on a unique feature of the part. Here are the connector. You can see the cyan line. It finds the edge, the outside edge. And you can see the position X, Y, and the angle. And you can also see the delta angle, which is zero because this is the taut location. In runtime, when you find uh, this connector, uh, it will calculate the x, y, and the angle, and the delta x, the delta y, and the delta angle. So it can move all of your uh, detectors that measure the diameters um, over the delta x, down the delta y, and tilt it to the delta angle. As shown here, this is the original image taut. Here it's down and over. Here it's down, over, and angled. And you can see the detectors follow the part. The next topic is maintenance and sustainability. But just like in real life, we've run out of time. So please look at our separate video on maintenance and sustainability.